Hey guys, as here, Chill Canine. Um, we are going to be doing outs with Canine Car. You may remember Car from earlier on our channel. Really nice uh, young dog that we imported from the Czech Republic. Why don't you show them Car? Big head boy. Anyways, we're going to be doing outs with him. <laughs> When you are training the elk, there are a couple of things that you need to take into consideration. Most people rush the um, elk training process, and by that I mean they don't ensure that the foundation is correct in the dog. And by that I mean the dog needs to be able to bite very well before I worry about an elk. If he doesn't have a good in, I'm not worried about an elk. One of the biggest mistakes I see in bite work are people rushing the elk before the dog is properly showing the correct commitment and intensity in the actual gripping behavior. So now they're work, the dog's always worried about letting go and the, the, the quality of the grip deteriorates, okay? So when you're teaching the out properly, I'm presupposing that you have good grips and the dog is showing the correct level of intensity and commitment in those grips before you're ever worrying about letting go. Now, here's the other thing. There's a lot of different ways to teach the out. It's not a game in the sense that the dog, the, the highest level of reward for this type of dog is to bite the sleeve or the, the shirt or whatever it is that you're using. You have to understand that. So you're not going to be able to trade them for food. Um, a lot of the time you're probably not going to be able to trade him for a ball, not if he has the correct mindset when it comes to bite work because for him that's going to be the highest level of motivation and reward possible. So you have to understand He's trying to get the party started. So you have to understand this. When your reward, when when the highest level of, of motivation that your dog has is to bite. So trading games and stuff, in my opinion, it's only possible when the dog does not have the correct level of intensity and motivation for the bite work. So I don't do that. Now, this dog has been introduced to the e-collar. Um, he knows the e-collar in the context of outs on the ball obedience, so on and so forth. This is not his first introduction to the e-collar. If you're gonna use the e-collar to do this, you need to make sure that the dog knows the obedience with the e-collar, that the dog has outed a ball with the e-collar. I've done a lot of groundwork before I get to this place. So I'm just making that clear. Now we have an e-collar hooked up to the sound box. He's relatively sensitive on the e-collar, so it's not super high, all right? So what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be seeing me watch the dog um, we're going to give him some grips, we're going to um, let him let, we're going to show him he must let go and we're going to take him back and forth through that transition and make sure that we're always watching the emotion of the dog and making sure that's in the correct place. And I'll explain more about that as we work. So, um, Dylan, you can, uh, you can light the top. <laughs> This mark that you see right here between his eyes, that's from where I whacked him on the head when he wasn't listening. I'm kidding, he rubbed himself on the crate. <laughs> he rubbed himself on the crate, so relax. Anyways, as you can see here, we've got good grips, we've got good possession, okay? A lot of that's genetic, some of it's training, right? But it's all there. I can put some pressure on the dog. Yeah! Grip doesn't change. We don't have a big issue there. Okay. Good boy. Now I'm going to let him possess the sleeve again. Okay. And now we're going to introduce the OUT. So I want to make sure always, even though I said that the dog is in a good place to do them, I want to make sure that before I do them, he's in the best place. By the way, this thing I'm doing with his head, I'm promoting the possession. I'm not petting him to to pet him because he's a, he's, a, he's a nice dog. I'm petting him to promote the possession. I'm pinching him. I'm making a little bit more 
you know, frustration in the dog. I'm promoting, I gotta hold this. This guy's gonna take it from me. That's what I'm trying to do. And that's what I'm, I'm promoting, that mindset. So arm goes in, out. We're gonna make the, the I think you're gonna make the uh, command now. Out. Good. So a couple important things happened there, but a couple important things happened there. You heard the e-collar, tap, 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 he let go. The second he let go, I immediately went to miss this, okay? And the reason why is this. There are a couple ways that you can out a dog. You can out the dog in such a way that he lets go and he becomes passive. Okay, and there are certain situations maybe where you want to do that. For me, I prefer an out, you know, especially for a dog that I'm training to a very high level, I prefer an active out where the dog lets go. He can be silent or he can be barking, it doesn't particularly matter, but I want him active. I want him super intense, so the second he lets go, he doesn't let go and say, oh, it's over. I want him to let go and be like, I'm ready again. Like I want him drooling. I want that. I want that anticipation. I want his entire body quivering with anticipation for the reattack. Okay, a lot of people do out and bark. We're not gonna do out and bark with this guy because that's not his orientation and I really like to work within the dog's orientation. Some dogs, like this is a very high prey dog, okay? So for him, the silent out is natural. For some dogs that are a little bit more on the aggressive side, the barking is more natural. It's easier for the dog to stay active in the barking versus a silent out. So it depends on the dog you're dealing with. You have to be able to read the dog and make the correct um, associations and, and decisions for what the training is going to be. So for this guy, the silent out is ideal. So we're going to do it again. But first, I'm going to work that trip. We're going to make. there a little bit of resistance but that's okay that's to be expected the, the temptation of course is always to go up make it again Aus. Aus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good boy. Oh, yeah. so we'll let him possess now and catch uh, his breath good boy and now, the next time I pick up the sleeve, guess what I'm not going to do? OUTs. The next time I pick up the sleeve, it's not going to be out. It's just going to be working the grip and the intensity again. When you work on something, if you work on it too much, you can create a flatness in the dog where he starts auto-outing. Especially if he's a sensitive dog, right? If he's a sensitive dog, sensitive to the handler, sensitive to patterns, and you always go in the same pattern, and you're, oh, why is he automatically letting go? I haven't told him to let go. It's because he's trying to anticipate you. He's trying to anticipate the pressure. So be random. If you're random, you'll have a better result where the dog is always in a state of anticipation of the reattack because he knows it's a possibility. If he knows that there's gonna be three outs in a row before, he gets, before you slip the sleeve, then he's gonna act accordingly and he's gonna to wanna to get those outs out of the way. This kind of dog, okay? Again, different kinds of dogs behave differently when you're doing this training. What's your recall or set to? Eight. Make it a 10. We're gonna add a smidgen more pressure. A smidgen more pressure on this exercise. And again, this is not the first time we've used the e-collar. If you are trying to do this for the first time and you've not used any kind of e-collar, you can't use it. I'm sorry, it's, it's just a bad idea. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Hey. And I'm not whacking the dog. It makes it, it may appear to be that way. I'm actually hitting his collar and I'm hitting the chain just to create that, just to create that mindset where he sees that stick coming down. He feels the action because it hits his flat collar or hits the chain his collar is attached to. So he feels the, the shock of it, but he's not getting the full impact of the stick whacking him, right? And obviously, as you can see, 
It's not like, uh, I'm not hitting him with a metal rod here, right? And why we hit dogs in protection is another video altogether. I'm gonna do a video on why we hit dogs in protection because I always get people, oh, you know, why do you do that? And uh, there's a video, I'm gonna actually explain it properly, why we actually will use a whip to make noise and to stimulate the dog with the whip and why we use a stick in the protection because this is not a game, okay? Even when it's a sport, it's not a game. Everything is, has a reason and a purpose. It's not just because we're mean and we get off on it, which a lot of idiots online seem to assume. Everything is for a reason. Everything's for a purpose. Everything I do with this whip is for a purpose. Oh, yeah. And now, house! See there, I did a different pattern now. I did just a couple really quick ones and then I gave him the sleeve. And I'm just letting him absorb between reps. I'm not pushing the dog to exhaustion. Now he's gonna breathe, he's gonna possess his prize. Oh, Haz, why do you train with the arm thing? It's not real protection. Listen, the vast majority of the skills I put into the dog, we use the sleeve for it, okay? Because I can't have him biting my bare arm for obvious reasons. That being said, what I'm also instilling in the dog is the correct emotion, right? So right now I'm working on bike mechanics and I'm working on skills like letting go. Why would I use a bodysuit for that? I mean, you can, but why would I? I can create better precision and better grips using something like this. So every tool I use has a purpose too, okay? So a lot of people, they equate the realness of a dog to the tools you're using. Oh, you're not using that bike suit. He's not so real. It's like the dog will bite a bike suit, no problem. It's not about the tools, it's about how you're using them and the mindset of the dog. When you make the right mindset, the dog will bite anything, it will bite any part of you. But right now we're working on fundamental skills and when we work on skills, we try to isolate things. So just like this, I use this wedge because the, the surface of the bite object is not so wide. So on the re-attack, after the, the, the dog lets go, he has a very narrow area to select from in order to bite. Now, if I'm gonna do the bite on the, on the, especially a lot of people, they have this problem on the bite suit. The dog lets go and then he's biting here and he's biting here and he's biting all over, right? Now, of course, people put guards on the suit and so on and so forth, but for me, it just makes much more sense to, to use a smaller biting surface, show the dog what I want there, and then progress to something like a bite suit, so on and so forth, okay? So now we're going to get back into it. Good. We'll slip it now again. Again, just to not be predictable, I'm going to slip. Good. Okay. And we're going to pick it up. And again, now make it. Out. Also notice, like I said, uh, the reason I make the misses after he lets go, I jump back instead of just letting him bite again. I'm ensuring a lot of dogs, what happens is if you just make them let go and keep your arm there and then let them reattack the arm, they don't come with the same intensity that they initially came with. I create more arousal and anticipation by jumping back, making him miss. And now, maybe a few sessions from now, I say to him, okay, I'm not gonna move, now bite me again without me jumping back. But he has all that anticipation that I've built into him by jumping back, by making those misses. He's all about it now. So now when he hammers me on the re-attack after the out, right, the re-attack. When he's, when he's biting me again after the out, okay, he's coming with all that anticipation and he's just hammering right through me because he expects me to be doing that, okay? I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna make him let go here, and then what we'll do is I'm not gonna move. We'll let him bite, and we'll see what that looks like. Now, he's a very big gripping dog. As you can see, fantastic natural grips on him, okay? For those of you wondering, this is a dog that we're training for personal protection for a client. He is sold, but if you wanna see our available dogs, check out our website. You know, the fantastic imports and dogs that are bred here that we have available, and they're getting this good work. Yeah, man. Good. Huh? Huh? Uh, 
Okay, make it now, don't. Auf! That's good. Yeah. Got like a good oh. reattack. You see how he kind of came oh. halfway? Right? Dog's not ready for me to stand still. And that's what I'm talking about when it comes to rushing. Right? If I just said, okay, I'm just going to stand here, you're going to bite me again. It's not good enough. I need to spend a few sessions getting back from the dog, really creating that anticipation on the rear attack so he hammers through me. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to do it the right way. Good boy. <laughs> okay, make it again now. Ouch! <laughs> That's way! Oh, a little faster that time. Boy. Oh. Okay, turn your e collar up. Two more points. Make it again. Ouch! Let him rest and we'll do one more rep. Very good. Good. You guys get the idea. Everything that we do is for a reason. It's not just random things, right? You have to know all the pitfalls so that when you're training, you avoid the pitfalls. Like the dog tar retargeting bad areas, the dog re-engaging with less intensity than he initially engaged with, right? Make the OUT. Down the watch. on the out again presupposing you're laying the correct groundwork if you're not laying the correct groundwork don't jump to that a lot of these behaviors we teach in the obedience and in the play before we ever add it to a man with a suit or a sleeve on so I hope that helps like subscribe follow us on Instagram um, and it's just uh, we are working on an online training series by the end of July 2021 it should be available on our website Check it out. It'll be everything from obedience training to protection training. Um, and also, lastly, I want to mention our sponsor, Eric Outdoor USA. They make fantastic training pants. As you can see, we're all wearing them. We all use them. Use promo code SHIELD15, S-H-I-E-L-D-15, ericusa.com, A-A-R-A-K-U-S-A.com. SHIELD15, save 15% off your next order. Thank you for watching.